Hi, Tom. Welcome back to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me back, Rachel. Could you please briefly introduce yourself for our listeners who may not yet have heard your previous episode? Certainly. I'm Thomas Island. I'm a 37-year-old man on the autism spectrum living in Los Angeles, California in the United States. I'm a certified public accountant and recently left that career in order to tell my story. And I recently wrote a book sharing my secrets to success called Come to Life, Your Guide to Self-Discovery. And I'm using this book as a basis to start my own business called Come to Life Coaching. And I also am a Toastmasters International accredited speaker. There are only 88 of them in the world. And these are individuals that have mastered the art of public speaking and apply it to their particular trade. I also am a certified human potential coach, so I can help people ask and answer the right questions in order to discover who they really are and put them on the path to what they really want. So I've had a lot of trials and tribulations as well as triumphs. And that was the theme of a TEDx talk that I've done called How to Come to Life. You can find it on YouTube. And I'm basically living the best life that I can while also addressing the struggles that I have on a continued basis, particularly given the pandemic and a lot that's happened in the world as of late. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about your background and why you decided to become a public speaker. I know you mentioned that you are also a certified public accountant. Could you share actually that transition moment when you decided like, this is not for me anymore? So when I was shortly after I was shortly diagnosed when I was 13, I had the dream of becoming George Lucas's accountant because I love Star Wars and I'm good with numbers. And my parents let me know what I, what I had to do. I had to take tests. I had to take college courses. I had to get several jobs. And I said, all right, challenge accepted. So I went on to go to school, get my license and worked for Disney straight out of college. And Disney went on to acquire Lucasfilm. So the way I see it, retroactively and indirectly, I was George Lucas's accountant and had accomplished <laughs> my goal. So I had, mm -hmm. uh, a I had a number of accounting jobs after that internship at Disney. And more and more as I progressed through the jobs, I found myself feeling more and more drained, more and more depressed, and more and more like something else out there was for me, like I belonged elsewhere. And I also saw and heard multiple stories about my peers crashing and burning because they did not know themselves. They did not love themselves. They were not being themselves. And I realized it was time for me to start sharing my story, my struggles, and my successes with the world in order to help other people see that they have the power, just as I realized I have the power. So six years ago, I took a big leap of faith and put in my two weeks at my last accounting job. It was a very well-paid job. I think I was making more than my dad at one point. And I now am involved in public speaking and personal coaching and also diversity and equity and inclusion consulting. And uh, Toastmasters International, it's a nonprofit, has really helped me come out of my shell and see some public speaking secrets. Yeah. So you mentioned that Toastmasters is an organization to help people become public speakers. How did you first get involved with the organization? I'd first heard about it when I was in sixth grade and a couple of my classmates had organized a, like a gavel club, a small group of people giving speeches and feedback on those speeches. And then Toastmasters found its way back into my life shortly after I left accounting, or even before I left accounting, I found it during the time I was working a desk job. And it's like, oh yeah, I remember that from elementary school. And, and at the same time, I'm like, mm -hmm. I, want, I want to do public speaking. So I helped charter a club in my hometown. It's called The Outliers because we, we move around a little bit location-wise, but each and every one of us is unique, extraordinary, and even a little quirky in our own ways. <laughs> so I embraced the structure of the meetings. I understood the importance of like thinking on your feet and looking at uh, body language and nonverbal communication. And I really excelled within the organization, uh, completing several speeches and making a lot of educational accomplishments, and even pursuing a career in professional speaking and Toastmasters having a designation for that. And I've had several 
people on the autism spectrum be in my Toastmasters clubs, and they've come out of their shell too. So how does that work exactly? You said you chartered a club. Do you have to organize it yourself and get the people together? or And does someone else facilitate it, or do you lead it? It's an interesting process. So if you have about 20 people, because it takes 20 people to charter a Toastmasters club, 20 people that want to better their public speaking skills, their communication, or their leadership as it applies to maybe their uh, jobs or personal lives or something else about them that they all have in common that can be used to help charter a club. And usually there would be like a club growth director or someone in your area that can assist you with filing the paperwork and letting international headquarters know, we'd like to start this this club named this name and You'll have officers like a president, a vice president of education, membership, secretary, treasurer, because it's like running a small business in a sense. Even though it's a nonprofit, right. it's, it has operations and members will come and go as the club goes on and you have to constantly promote yourself and show why Toastmasters is, is important to you and at least that group that you're a part of. So what was your role exactly? So I started as the uh, first official president of the Outliers, and I'm now the VP of Education. So I make sure that all the members are completing their speeches and holding them accountable to their progress and making sure that they are getting value out of the club and accomplishing what they had set out to do when they joined the club. And I'm also mm -hmm. pr promoting the club like on social media. I also go to different clubs around the world, virtually, at least. And I've done workshops, I've given keynotes. And it's been a really wonderful experience, a way to connect people and become closer, even if we are socially or physically distanced in this pandemic. Yeah. So how many clubs are there worldwide? There are hundreds, about, thousands, uh, uh, thousands. There are about 350,000 members in six, 16,000 wow. clubs in about 143 countries around the world. Wow. That's incredible. So what was your journey like to become an accredited speaker? So part of becoming an accredited speaker involves having speaking engagements, basically showing that you do professional speaking for a living and the application process begins with you documenting 25 speeches that you've done for audiences. And they have to have at least 20 people in the audience. They have to be at least 20 minutes in length. They can't be the Toastmasters audiences. So you can't go to, from club to club to club, just giving speeches. Mm -hmm. it, has to, it has to be for organizations outside of Toastmasters. And 15 of those 25 speeches have to be paid. So I'd have to receive some monetary compensation for them. So once I get the 25 speeches documented, I then have to record myself giving a speech to an audience that will be judged at the headquarters level by a panel of judges, and they'll be looking for like audience reaction, my central message, body language, and is my message being well received? And then they'll decide, okay, you're good to go to the next level, come to our international conference and give a, another speech there that's getting judged. Or, and this did happen to me, they, they'll say, we're sorry you didn't meet the criteria, please apply the following or consider these steps like showing your audience more or having your message be more clear, be more well defined, and then resubmit. So I'd have to get mm. twenty so I'd have to get twenty five more speaking engagements, submit a new video until I got oh, to wow. the next level. And the next level I, I did do this in twenty nineteen. When I got to level two in the process, I went to the international conference in Denver, Colorado and spoke in front of about a thousand people sharing a speech that I would give at an autism conference, for example. And I d did an interesting spin on the speech. In Toastmasters, we had something called the Competent Communication Manual, which describes different speeches and looks at different elements of giving a speech. So I titled my speech for my credit speaker, Competently Communicating Autism. Mm -hmm. That was that was my mm -hmm. speech title, and and the audience totally rolled with it, and headquarters <laughs> is all right with me using that title. And the judges said, "You passed. You are now an accredited speaker." Cool. Well, congratulations on that. Is there another level after this? Uh, interesting, you ask that because I find that 
over the course of my life, I've always wondered, how can I one-up myself? Or what's next? What's the next level of growth? So I am an accredited speaker in Toastmasters now. They, Toastmasters International also has the annual World Championship of Public Speaking. These are five to seven minute speeches about what you want to tell the world. And a lot of them have some kind of unifying message or underlying theme to the times. Like in 2019, the year that I got a credit speaker, the world champion was a gentleman wearing like a, an Indian wedding outfit. He was the best man in an Indian wedding and described some of the traditions within an Indian wedding and how he was responsible for the groom's shoes and everyone was fighting <laughs> to get these shoes from him. And even though he did <laughs> lose, the, even though he did lose the shoes, he explained that for that moment, two families were united and enjoying themselves and communicating and connecting. And he was the only African American man there. So for that brief moment, everyone was having fun. Everyone was united and he helped make that happen. So he won in mm -hmm. 2019. And last year, a gentleman described how, he had had some failures when he was a kid in school, and it's all about keeping going, trying, keeping learning from your mistakes, even if you mess up. When you can pick yourself up and keep learning from your mistakes, that's going to make you a better person. And, that, mm -hmm. and, that, and last year was the first virtual international speech contest, and they're going to be it virtual again this year due to COVID. So yeah. I want so I want to compete and I want to be a world champion of public speaking. It's very complex and I have to get my message well organized. I have to appeal to the judges and yeah. make, it, make it happen for myself. Yeah, well that's an exciting project to work on. Let's rewind a little bit. Can you tell the story of your first public speaking event? How old were you at that time, and how did you feel leading up to it? So my first official public speaking event in my new career, if you will, was in January 2016, about a month and a half after I left accounting, and the talks of the speaking engagement were actually during my time in my last accounting job. It was going to be a keynote address for the Council for Exceptional Children at the Waikiki Marriott in Honolulu, Hawaii. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking this is a, an opportunity I cannot pass up. And it's such a, a lovely getaway. And my message, I had it all composed and I wanted to deliver the speech. But my accounting job basically said, you don't have enough hours to be taking this time off. And I'd also gotten a, re a performance review that basically was telling me, you've got three months to shape up or you're going to be let go. And so three days mm -hmm. after that performance review, I put in my two weeks notice. So I went into this Hawaii speaking engagement with an open mind, feeling free of not having to answer to a corporate um, holdback, so to speak. And I actually wrote, uh, I was taking Toastmasters at the time, I actually wrote most of my speech on the plane ride from Los Angeles to Hawaii. <laughs> But I had the guidance and I had the message clear. So by the time the keynote happened, I nailed it. I got a standing ovation. And that was when I knew I'd found where I belonged. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel nervous presenting in front of large audiences? I have. I still get like that butterfly in my stomach or the, the jello legs feeling, particularly if it's uh, a new speech that I haven't done before. A crowd I haven't spoken to in the past, or so, a new format that I haven't really done before. So there are times where I have felt nervous, but managing that fear, becoming more from it, and also keeping in the back of my mind that the audience wants to hear what I have to say. They want me to succeed, and that when it's over, everyone's going to be clapping. Th that helps me overcome that nervousness or shaky feeling. Yeah. So what are some strategies that you've learned that have helped you in public speaking? Well, for one thing, whenever possible, I use the bathroom immediately before the speech. So I'm not doing a little dance while I'm on <laughs> the, the stage or in front of people. That's definitely one. That's something that I, <laughs> I guess people wouldn't even really think about doing, right? Mm-hmm. 
And, and, if, <laughs> and if possible, I won't drink a whole lot of water right before the speech because that might also produce the same effect. Another, <laughs> yeah. another strategy I use is to, I, I tend to write my speeches out or I'll have an outline to organize my ideas. If all else fails, I make the speech as much a conversation as possible. Because the more mm. personal you can be, the more like unscripted you can be at times, the more you mm -hmm. involve, involve the audience in your speech or your workshop, the more likely you're going to connect and relate to them and them to you. So if all else fails, I improvise. And I actually am part of an improv Toastmasters group where we have that yes and mentality. We roll with the punches. We laugh at ourselves and have fun. Because whenever I do a speech, I do my best to make it fun, as fun and enjoyable as possible. So those are some of the some of the strategies. Yeah, I'm sure the audience can tell that if you're having fun, it's more relaxing for them to sit there and listen to your presentation. Indeed. So how does your autism impact your public speaking, like positively and maybe negatively? Well, I always have a good story to tell. I've got lots of life experience and some situations that went well or maybe not so well. Like uh, most recently last month, I helped drive a woman and her dog from California to Florida across the country. She was moving there and I was her driver and her security and looking after the dog and such. But we had a few mishaps along the way, like uh, the dog bit me twice. Uh, we hit a coyote. That there was no oh damage. There, there was no damage to the car or anything. The coyote, I can't say the same, but but ultimately, <laughs> I got I got her and the dog there in one piece. As far as some ways that autism might be holding me back or making me come off as not so competent or confident, I think it's in my affect or my uh, tone of voice, because vocal variety and volume and tone of voice that. I have to think about these or actually incorporate them into the speech versus them coming naturally. So particularly in contests when vocal variety is like a, a criteria in the judge's ballot, if they don't see or hear that from me or to the degree that they would find excellent, then I'm doing myself a disservice just because of how I sound or how I'm naturally speaking, if that makes sense. Yeah. So do you record yourself and listen back to learn? I have. I do record my speeches. I speak in front of mirrors to see how I might come off. And even in our most recent uh, set of contests, I type my speech out, deliver it in front of a mirror, thinking about how I might come across and end up getting second place in the contest. Granted, the first place winner can't compete at the next level. I could take her place and keep on going. But the point is, I'll never know what the judges truly thought. I can't see their ballots or ask for them. And so I just, have oh, to, okay. I, I just have to keep thinking about how I can one-up myself. What could I have done better? Because I could have mm. contested the results. I could have said, hey, judge, why didn't you vote for me? But at the end of the day, it's on me. I have to ask myself, what, what could I do better? What do I have to do to improve and make what I want happen? Mm-hmm. How do your strengths related to autism help your public speaking? I would say my strengths related to autism, at least with, in my case, I'm very organized. I am able to have a bit of what I like to call a Batman mentality because part of my theme of come to life is to be the hero in your life. Whenever I'm facing a struggle or thinking about how times are tough, I think about a hero like Batman. He's a human being. He's got some difficult things that happened to him as a kid, but he gave himself to an ideal. He found a way to face his fears and goes out into the darkness to help others and make the world a better place. So I've adopted that Batman mentality. So I'm going out there showing what I can do, setting hopefully a good example and making the world a better place in my own regard. So mm -hmm. I adopt that. I see autism in that sense as a superpower, allowing me to yeah. overcome significant obstacles. Why is it important for you to share your story? 
because no one tells your story better than you do. And I think particularly in the autism community, too many people on the spectrum are not speaking up at all, letting other people tell their story for them, or not seeing what life really has to offer them. And that's why I named my book Come to Life, because life isn't going to come to you. like Some miracle is not just going to fall into your lap. It's up to you to come to life. You have to go out there and make things happen for yourself. And I think that when we embrace that concept, get out of our comfort zone, come out of our shell, face fears, that's going to improve outcomes all around. Yeah, so this is actually a, a good segue to talk about your come to life coaching. And on your website, you emphasize that when one person in the family is on this autism spectrum, the entire family is on the autism spectrum, and all family members must grow and evolve together. So why do you think it's important to include family members in the coaching as well? Because the family is, or at least should be, a, a unified front on the same page if everyone is going to move forward together. I think too many families are under the impression that once the person on the autism spectrum is corrected or behaves right or made to do well, that everything is suddenly going to be all right in that family. I can assure you that is not the case. The entire family needs therapy, not just the person on the autism spectrum. The entire family needs to be engaged and involved with the change so that they all move together forward, onward, and upward versus being left behind. And it also doesn't, or at least reduces the possibility of avoiding blame being put on each other. And speaking from my own experience, even accepting my own diagnosis, I couldn't accept that I had autism or accept my diagnosis until I knew my parents had accepted my diagnosis. That was mm -hmm. a, a significant prerequisite that I think too many families overlook that the child on the spectrum does not feel loved unless he or she knows that the parents love him or her no matter what. So I really encourage parents, siblings, close family members, and extended family members to be loving and accepting of the person on the spectrum. And everyone needs to be there for that person rather than looking to make them something they're not. So speaking from your experience, did you feel that your parents didn't accept your autism when you were diagnosed? There was initially denial, particularly when I was younger. I was about four years old when my aunt, my mother's sister, who was the autism specialist for the state of Illinois, where I was born, suggested that I might be on the spectrum. And my mother, I was her firstborn, didn't want to believe it. No, 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 that's nonsense. All geniuses play in the corner by themselves and don't have time for the silly games that the other little kids play. And my aunt had other ideas and took me for an informal screening without my mother's knowledge and made it out to be like a play date. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm playing games, solving puzzles with my aunt. This is fun. And little did I know that I was getting screened for autism and my mother eventually found out and like totally freaked. And it wasn't until about eight or nine years later when the diagnostic criteria showed that I don't have to have an intellectual disability to be on the spectrum. And my mother had to come to her own terms on accepting that, yes, her firstborn son is on the spectrum, but that doesn't mean I sh that she shouldn't love me and that, she's, that I can still have a good life. Because I think too many parents think that once an autism diagnosis is in the mix, that that kid has no future. But let me assure you, that kid does and must have a future. It might be a little different than what you envisioned, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. Too many families are writing off their children's future before they can even happen once they learn of that diagnosis. Whereas my mother, once she came to terms with the denial and accepted me for who I was, started helping me have a future for, for myself. For example, uh, my family found uh, 
a condo, a condominium complex, and started shopping for a place for me, telling me, Tom, one day you're going to live here. And I had some hope for the future, thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to have my own place. I'm going to have my own freedom. I'm going to have my own future. I might have a roommate or someone that stays with me in this condo complex. So my parents were helping me see that I could have a life of my own. And once again, I think too many families are stopping or even eliminating their young people from having a future to call their own. And that is what's causing so many poor outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, we see this also in other countries too, where there's a lack of understanding of what of what autism even is. And so doctors are telling parents that there is no hope. In the US, we talk about acceptance, but we forget that in other places around the world, they're not even really there yet. I mean, not to make the conversation so grim, but I think it's important to remember this so that we can empower people to become self-advocates in their communities so that people can see, hey, actually, you know, just because you have autism doesn't mean that you can't become a public speaker or that you can't be gainfully employed. And it's from seeing those people in communities that these stigmas can be broken, stereotypes can be broken, and, and parents can be given hope. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons that I became a certified human potential coach, to see the potential and the possibilities. I think we tend to write off people on the autism spectrum as not being capable of doing X, Y, and Z. And that causes their lives to go downhill. So I want to challenge people to be not only aware of autism and how it affects or impacts the person, but be accepting. And with April on the horizon here, we have autism awareness. We also have autism acceptance, being loving and accepting. We are human mm -hmm. beings. We are part of the human race, and we are here to stay. So I suggest you make the most with what you've got and help us live the life that we want so that we can be the best version of ourselves. And as the conversation and the narr narrative of autism continues to evolve, I want to see Autism Action Month. From awareness to acceptance to action, what are you doing to help people on the autism spectrum? What are you doing to help them live the best life that they can to pursue happiness? And that way, everybody grows and evolves together. I like that. Huh. I think you're onto something there, Tom. <laughs> so, you know, talking about some of these kinds of limitations that people are on the spectrum are given. I wanted to talk about your Toastmasters accredited speaker speech. Mm -hmm. I saw your video on your website and you talked about some of the misconceptions about autism. One being that people on the spectrum cannot empathize with others. And I'd love it if you could share that story about how your mother taught you to take another person's perspective. Yes. So there was a time I was in junior high school. It was a very hot day, and I was on a school bus heading home, and the bus hit a dog. And the superintendent was called out, and we kids had to stay on this bus while the situation was resolved. And kids are crying, screaming. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, when am I going to get home? This is unbearable. It's too hot. And we came to find out that uh, there was a boy on the bus, Justin, the dog was his. So everyone was comforting him and, and crying with him, being totally sad. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, can we just get home already, please? So we, I finally do get home. I stumble in the door and I tell my mother what happened. And she asked me, how do you think Justin's feeling right now? And I said, confused. And then she told me, remember when we were on vacation and came home we found your goldfish floating at the top of the bowl. How did you feel then? I said, oh my gosh, I felt terrible. That was so sad. She said, okay, take those terrible, sad feelings and give them to Justin. That was the day that I learned what empathy is. 
And it is very much possible for people on the autism spectrum to feel empathy. Like we're not some cold, heartless a-holes. We are capable of feeling other people's feelings. If anything, we take on more of other people's feelings than we might want to in some cases. And when we have context, when we have something to relate to that has happened to us, that's going to help us relate more. So anytime you think of asking, how would you feel if? Instead, ask, how did you feel when? When it comes to the autism spectrum, ask, how did you feel when this happened to you? Because they can recall that incident or that instance, get the feelings, and then possibly apply those feelings to the situation at hand. So it is possible very much for people on the autism spectrum to feel empathy. Yeah, I think that's just such a great reminder to um, to teach things in the way that the learner can understand them. We have to adapt our way of teaching. And if it's not working, then that means that style isn't working, that it's not necessarily the student's fault, but maybe the teacher needs to adapt their method. Very much so. Yeah. Okay, Tom, I want to go back to your mantra that you mentioned, know yourself, love yourself, and be yourself. So what do you think it means to know yourself? So what it means to know yourself is, well, first, uh, understanding if you have a diagnosis and how it impacts you, because knowing yourself means understanding not only your strengths, but also your opportunities for improvement. And I think this is another big matter in the autism community. We tend to focus too much on one person's strengths without fully addressing where the person can improve. And they make the same mistakes over and over again, possibly undoing the progress of their strengths. On the same token, we focus too much on where one person falls short and where they keep failing. They may never know where they can truly thrive and what they're really good at. And on a side note, this is why I don't use terms like high-functioning or low-functioning and why those kinds of terms need to go. Because when you call someone high-functioning, makes or it might increase the risk of them becoming arrogant. I don't need help. I'm high-functioning. And it dismisses their needs and their struggles because they probably need help too. And on the same token, low-functioning, you call someone that name, it dismisses their strengths and capabilities. And no one wants to be called that kind of name. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. knowing, your, knowing yourself means understanding your strengths and opportunities for improvement. And that's a Toastmasters term, opportunities for improvement. When we get our speeches evaluated, we look at how we can do better. And both subjects, both areas get addressed versus one or the other. So that's part of knowing yourself and understanding who you are as a person and pursuing more knowledge and acting on that knowledge. So what does it mean to love yourself? Part of loving yourself is accepting who you are as a person and your diagnosis. Like I mentioned with my mother and even people on the spectrum themselves, they think, no, I don't have an autism diagnosis. I forget that. And also understanding that once you love yourself, others are going to love you in return. I I think too many people on the spectrum are waiting to be loved, but don't love themselves first. So how can they expect the love that they seek to come when deep down they're not loving themselves? So Mm. So loving yourself is also the importance of saying no, establishing and enforcing boundaries, understanding what you will and will not tolerate, and protecting your time, your energy, and your peace of mind, those are critical elements to loving yourself. Seeing that you have what it takes, you are very much worthy and capable of love. This is another stereotype in the autism community or what people might think that people on the autism spectrum don't love or are not capable of that feeling or unable to form and maintain relationships or get married and have children. There's so many families out there that have someone on the autism spectrum. And even I've seen The Good Doctor recently, the the TV show on ABC. Spoiler alert, Sean, the doctor on the autism spectrum, and his girlfriend are expecting a baby. They're following that journey that Sean, the doctor, is going to be a father. 
it's incredible that they are exploring. They've talked about his employment struggles, his relationship struggles, finding a yeah. girlfriend. Now he has one and they're expecting. So mm-hmm. it is possible for people on the autism spectrum to have love, to have relationships, to have families and futures. Mm-hmm. But it'll only work if you love yourself first. Got it. And the last part of your mantra be yourself, you know, it got me thinking about how many people with autism, especially younger people, tend to mask their autism so that they can fit in socially. So how have you learned to be yourself over the years? And be yourself is a huge step in authenticity, being who you are versus wanting to please others. And and we mentioned earlier in this podcast about parents wanting the best for their children or children answering to their parents. And the biggest be yourself step for me ultimately was stepping away from doing my mother's bookkeeping. Because even though I left Mm -hmm. accounting, I still did her bookkeeping on the side. But I had to put my foot down and tell her, I'm not meant for this. This is not what I want. I have to go do what I want to do. And once I really let go of accounting, because accounting is not me. I am not accounting. I am meant to do speaking, coaching, consulting, and so much more than this number crunching. And she was resistant. She's like, no, we have, you help your family out. And she even accused me of having black and white thinking. That's common in the autism community. Like we have black and white thinking one way or the other. So I shot back out of improvisation, thank you, improv, Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. Speaking of black and white thinking, accounting to me is like being in the black market. While it's fast, big money, I shouldn't be there. And I feel like crap during and afterwards. (laughs) And I think that hugged enough on her heartstrings to let me go. Mm. So Mm -hmm. I had to speak up for myself and I had to realize what I really want and pursue what I truly feel I am meant to do in this lifetime, walk away from something I am no longer wanting to be a part of. That Mm -hmm. is being yourself, existing in a way that helps you become your best self. Yeah. So you mentioned your TEDx talk earlier, and we'll post a link to it in our show notes. Um, And in that talk, you spoke about your ex-girlfriend who resisted services because she didn't want to change. So can you talk about that distinction that you made between be yourself and be your best self? Awesome question. So to give a little bit of context to this relationship, I knew this woman long distance. She was from Illinois, just like me. And the same aunt who is the autism specialist introduced me to her. We both loved Star Wars, and that was the foundation for our long distance friendship. We were pen pals for about 10 years. We'd see each other at Christmas time when the family and I would visit relatives in Illinois. After about 10 years of knowing each other, we became a couple. She said she liked me. I hadn't really thought of her as girlfriend material, so to speak, but I thought, all right, let's give this a shot, see where it goes. And she proceeds to move out to California with me into the condo that I live in now. And shortly thereafter, I realized she's missing a lot of uh, some of the basics, so to speak, because she's in her mid-20s, had never had services her entire childhood. And my mother and I are getting help for her, a lot of services that worked for me, like speech therapy, a job coach, someone to help with college and navigating college. And she calls her mother back in Illinois, who's also on the autism spectrum, to explain the help she was getting. And the mother responds, they're looking to change you. Don't let them. And my now ex-girlfriend thought that my mother and I were looking to change her and was resisting the help. And I wanted to give her some time. I think maybe she'll come around. It took me years to become who I am. I'm going to give her some time. After four years and me turning 30, I realized I don't want another four years of this. And I ended the relationship. And as she's getting ready to move back to Illinois, she says, it's a shame you guys wanted to change me this whole time. I like myself the way I am. And what she and her mother misunderstood was that my mother and I were not looking to change her. We wanted to help her get the services and the support she needed to help her live the life that she wanted. 
she wanted to be a graphic designer. This help that she was getting would help her get that, but she didn't see it that way. And this is another big matter in the autism community that all those allies, as we call them in Come to Life, parents, teachers, therapists, people on the spectrum are thinking or have that misconception that these people want to change them versus help them get what they want. So what needs to happen is the allies, the parents, the teachers, the therapists need to explain to the young person on the spectrum that the help they're getting is going to help them get what they want. Make it about the young person and their goals. They have goals. They want to do something. Help them meet them and that these services will help them get there. When that is concretely, directly, and explicitly explained, then hopefully the person on the spectrum will be on board with the services and start to see the value in them. Yeah, that is a really good point to make. And I think a lot of professionals in the field skip over that. We question what is socially significant, yes, but I think without that missing piece of connecting it to what the long-term goal is of that person, then you know, the lack of cooperation might not help them get to where they need to be, either quick enough or maybe even at the level that they could achieve. And even something as basic as uh, social skills. Like, for example, when I was a kid, I wanted to have a girlfriend, and my mother got me into social skills classes. I'm like, well, I don't want to go to these classes. But she reminded me, you want to have a girlfriend, don't you? I'm like, yeah. She said, well, these social skills classes will help you get a girlfriend. I'm like, all right, I'll go. So connect the dots. Show that what you're doing to help this person will help them get what they want, live the life that they want, and that will hopefully put them on board. Yeah. And this actually kind of ties back to your previous episode on this podcast, Tom, where we were talking about requesting accommodations at school and at work. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like you need to first acknowledge and be aware of what your needs are and then know that when you that speaking up for them and asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weakness at all. If anything, it's a sign of strength to ask questions. Even Einstein, who's believed to be on the spectrum, asks questions. And there was a time where I thought I had to know everything or if I asked questions, it meant I was stupid. But the reality is I was stupid if I didn't ask questions, if I didn't ask for help. And you're right. When it comes to college or on the job in particular, the the problem seems to be that someone doesn't know their diagnosis. They don't know how their diagnosis affects them. And they don't know what accommodations are available. So as a result, they fail their tests, they drop out of college, they fail on the job, they get fired or quit because they haven't gone through that valuable and imperative process of self-discovery to understand who they are, what they need to succeed, and how to go get it. Mm. So once we go through this prequel to transition, this process of self-discovery, then the outcomes are going to get better. And of course, you know, the younger you get on this journey of self-discovery, the quicker you'll have access to a better quality of life. But do you see some clients who are older who are still going through that self-discovery phase? Very much so. And it's an ongoing process too, because at different times in our lives, we have to reevaluate who we are, what we want, and where we're going. And I have a client, for example, who has several engineering degrees, but because of the way the economy has been or his social communication difficulties, he's having to be a barista at a Starbucks. Not that there's anything wrong with Starbucks baristas, but he's told me he wants more. He wants to go after something bigger and greater for himself. So he and I are in talks with him about starting his own coding business or starting to teach courses about coding and engineering. So he's becoming more financially and personally independent for it. And When we help young people find their niche and help them pursue what they really like and how they can create value for others rather than adhering to a corporate structure or a job that doesn't make their heart sing, then their life gets better. Then they make a change and a difference in the world. Very cool. Okay, Tom, we have a question from one of our listeners, Griffin to Autism. All right. 
he wants to know, where do you find the balance between achievement and joy? Or do you think they're correlated? Well, that would depend on the person and how they define joy or achievement, or even success for that matter. Because I know there, that there was a time where like my parents had goals for me, and they still do. But at the end of the day, I said, well, I am the one that defines, or I will be my own definition of success. I'm going to decide what's success for me, not you. And success, joy, achievement, those definitions vary from person to person. For some people on the autism spectrum, an achievement could be gained through the entire day without a meltdown. Whereas for me, an achievement is becoming the world champion of public speaking. And I mm -hmm. think, th and, I, and this is something I'm currently kind of going through or analyzing as I go through my life. Like, do I need to be happy first for the achievements to come? Or will the achievements be the source of my happiness? And I think it's the former. I need to be happy with who I am first, be grateful for what I have, and then I will be empowered to make those achievements possible. So mm -hmm. making sure we put the, the horse before the cart here, I encourage you to find your joy, find your happiness, being grateful for what you have going for you, and then see your life be better and see yourself achieve what you want to happen. I hope that helped answer your question. Yeah. This is really fascinating also to look at from a cultural perspective because in the US, you know, I grew up there, now I live in Spain, but I'm an, I'm an American, so I know that there is such a stress on success in American culture and how much money you make, and how big is your house, and kind of keeping up with the Joneses. Um, and it's such a stark difference from here in Spain, where people don't measure success in that way. Like They look at meaningful relationships, and having two-hour lunches to hang out with your family, and not be rushed to go to work afterwards. You know, so it's, it's interesting how you're saying these definitions apply to the person. And if you take a step back and look at how they are across countries, across cultures, it's really interesting. It certainly is. And I think particularly, in, and again, in the autism community, I think we tend to measure success as a one-time thing. Or once this successful thing happens, then their life is going to be A-OK. -okay. I, I want to tell all of you, if you're on the autism spectrum or not, success is not a one-time event. It is an ongoing, long-term process. Multiple failures, rejections, and setbacks had to happen to me before I got Toastmasters accredited speaker. I'm not getting through multiple contests before I eventually get the world champion in public speaking. The relationships, the breakups, the jobs I've been fired from, the jobs I've quit from, they've all helped me make me into the man that I am today. And I think we need to start being more open to and learn from our failures. Because the more we just think, oh, it's, I failed, it's over, do what my family calls an autopsy on that failure. Why didn't it work out? <laughs> what, what worked for you and what didn't and why? Become more analytical as to what's working for you and what's not and why so that you don't keep making the same mistakes, so you pursue more of what's good for you and what's working for you, and hopefully less of what's not working for you. So success is a process. We need to see it that way versus a one-off or like the prerequisite for a good life. Mm. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, Tom, I'd like to close with one last question. Mm -hmm. What advice would you offer other autistic individuals who are interested in pursuing a career as a public speaker? I, I highly recommend Toastmasters International, and you can go to toastmasters.org and click on Find a Club and search the city where you live, see what clubs are meaning for you. They welcome guests, so you can sit in on meetings, see what they do, and you don't have to say anything. If you don't want to, you can just watch. And as I said earlier in this podcast, no one tells your story better than you do. So start thinking about times where you struggled, times where you failed, times where you wanted to tell your younger self something. And 
Begin making your mess into your message. Your mess becomes your message. Because there are people out there who not only want but need to hear what you have to say. And I, the reason I do podcasts and presentations like this is if I can reach one person and that person goes on to discover a cure for a disease or inspires other people to become their best selves or even saves their life, like they don't complete suicide because they heard me talk, then I knew it was worth it. People need to hear what you have to say. So begin to tell your story, face your fears, and know that you are making a difference. Great. How can people learn more about you? My website is cometolifecoaching.com. You can also find me on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, under the name Thomas Island. And there's no S in the island. So I-L-A-N-D, Thomas Island, you can find me. All right. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, Tom, and sharing your story with us. My pleasure. I think you're definitely an inspiration to so many young people out there. And you're right. Like one person who hears your story makes it all worth it. Thank you very much, Rachel. All right, Tom. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. If you're a self-advocate, I hope Tom's story of becoming a public speaker inspires you to share your own stories. The world needs to hear directly from autistic voices and not just during the month of April. Please make sure to subscribe to our podcast if you haven't already. We'll be making a big announcement in the next episode and you don't want to miss it. We're creating something exciting at the Global Autism Project that we think will benefit the whole autism community. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.